Welcome to episode 356 of We Don't Die Radio, where my goal is always to give you the best evidence of the afterlife. And even though our bodies will disappear, we will survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain. I'm the author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And I, it's been a while since I have recorded an episode, and I just wanted to let you guys know what's happening. First of all, when COVID-19 hit the world, my mom and I, who have run a 30, almost 35-year-old catering business, had to come to a screaming halt because we can no longer serve in the manner that we did before, which was big buffets for you know, thousands of people at a racetrack. Left with this, and then also she's older and I'm getting older, I have relocated and moved in with my mom. So we're safe, we're sound, but left without employment, I had to think of something fast. And my good friends, Carrie McLeod, Philip Dykes, Scott Milligan, same boat. They're phenomenal mediums, but could no longer travel. Well, we put our heads together and we created something pretty great. On Sundays, we do what's called the Sunday Gathering, and it's our spiritualist church service online, complete with mediumship demonstrations. And I'm proud to say that we have more than 2,000 people in our online congregation. So that sprang up. And as far as business goes, we have been doing Monday trance and altered states classes with Scott Milligan and psychic classes on Wednesdays and Thursdays. We've been doing mediumship classes and um, trance demonstrations with Scott on Fridays and all kinds of specialty courses. So thank the good Lord, I've been able to pay my mortgage and health insurance and things like that. And also I would have never guessed that we could make lemonade out of lemons because we have now such a group of people from all over the world that are getting in touch with their own spirituality, being able to learn to sit in the power and ignite their soul and realize there's something so much bigger going on than just our human lives. So I am safe, I am sound, I am back in action. The other good thing that's happened is I got asked by the producer of Coast to Coast AM, which you might know is a really big radio show that's syndicated on just zillions of stations across the world with millions of listeners to start a new podcast. It's called Shades of the Afterlife. It's paired with iHeartRadio. And it's an opportunity to get to an even bigger audience. Now, while we don't have commercials on this, there are commercials on that because the deal is you get to a much, much, much bigger audience with the commercial breaks. So if you don't mind them, and I think you trust me and you won't mind them, you'll give that show a listen. After the six plus years I've been doing We Don't Die Radio and now with episode 356 going on, I've learned an awful lot. And so the new show is really taking the best of the best. And it's not a show where I will interview per, one person per episode. There's all kinds of different thoughts usually on the episodes. So there's four 15 minute segments and there's different things to talk about. And it's like, if I only had that one chance to get to someone and let them know life after death is real, I power pack every single episode. So if you're interested in that, you can go to iHeartRadio.com and type in Shades of the Afterlife and you'll find that. So I've been busy and everything's good, but now as promised, I will get back into We Don't Die Radio. So this is one of our video episodes, very special, very rare, uh, but we are moving into this century and it's, we just had the new year. We are recording this at the beginning of January, 2021. And what an episode this is. We are welcoming back a guest that we first had three years ago on episode 141. Sharon DeBartolo Carmack is a certified genealogist, an accomplished and prolific writer, having written 30 books and hundreds of articles. Not quite 30, but close. Well, <laughs> close to 30. And she's a spiritualist medium, and in the United States, she's our representative for the Spiritualist National Union International. She's written a book that just came out 
and it's called In Search of Maria B. Hayden, MD, the American medium who brought spiritualism to the UK. So as a genealogist, she's got a great website. You can visit SharonCarmack.com. As a writer, you can check out nonfictionhelp.com. And as a medium and to direct you to everything is pathwaysup.com. So she'll set us straight on the book she's written, but I want to say, Sharon Carmack, a warm welcome back to We Don't Die Radio. And thank you, Sandra. Thank you for having me back again. I appreciate it. Did I twist it that you've been a genealogist for over 30 years? Maybe that's where I got the 30. <laughs> yes. I've, been a, I've been a certified genealogist for over 30. Uh, it's around 32 years now. Wow. And as a writer, though, you've got quite a number of books. Yes. Uh, In Search of Maria B. Hayden is my 24th book. Yes. So not quite 30, but a whole heck of a lot. Yes. So not everyone has heard our episode from a few years back. Would you mind covering a little ground about who you are, what you're up to, a little bit about the genealogy, and um, what about being a medium? And okay. then we can dive right into okay. Good. your gal. Well, as I said, I've been a professional certified genealogist for 32 years, thereabouts. And I... I think all genealogists connect with the spirits of their ancestors when they research them, whether they know it or not. And I certainly felt that I was probably being guided, but I wasn't really cognizant of it. I didn't develop my mediumship until I was 57 years old and I'm 64 now. And that's when I realized how strong the connection is between researching ancestors and mediumship. And when I was writing my book, In Search of Maria B. Hayden, I really felt like Maria was guiding me to sources that I might not have otherwise have found. And uh, so I really feel there is a connection with that. And so that's what we talked about in the first show is that connection. And also how important it is to learn about your ancestors. So if you are the recipient of a mediumship reading, you'll be able to recognize some of those people who might want to come through and say hello. I, I have a lot of relatives that I've never met, such as my um, one of my grandmothers, but I recognize her from the family stories and the research I've done. And she's come through before. So I think it's important to research your ancestors just in case they want to say hi. And it's a very special episode 142. Uh, you can visit it on YouTube if you want. This We Don't Die Radio 142. So you can put that in, but it's it's very, very special. And would you mind just a little bit about what SNUI is and what you do as the representative? The Spiritualist National Union International is open to anyone to join. You don't have to be a spiritualist. Anyone can join it, and it's terribly inexpensive. It's something like eight or 10 pounds, which equates to maybe $12 for the whole year. And you have access to classes, to services, to workshops, to lectures, all for that one low price. And there are things going on 24 hours a day, just about, because it is international. So no matter where you live, you can find something that you can attend. And I'm the U.S. representative, and I also lead a circle on Monday evenings in the U.S. Times and Tuesdays during the day. So it's, it's a bargain. It's really. Oh. Do you lead the circles online now? Yes. Yeah, we, we use Zoom. And Fantastic. I, lead the, I lead the circles online on Monday evening and Tuesday. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. And yeah, when I found out about SNUI, I thought this is, everybody needs to know about this. So I think you and I had talked about it before <laughs> and I've talked to many people about it for just a low price. They also have the spiritualist services online. Yes. And I just thought that this is fantastic. A, mm -hmm. a grandmother who I'd never met who had passed in a car accident before I was, <clears throat> excuse me, before, born, she had come through with such evidence. And I think the medium was in Finland. I, I mean, it was crazy yeah. how the intelligence of the... Um, One of the world. first readings I received on SNUI, I think the, the medium was from Germany. And it's like she had no way, and my mother came through and mm -hmm. she was spot on. She had no way of knowing anything about me or my mother. 
and it was like, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> we are so much more powerful than we know. We really have no idea. And I think as human beings, we've got so much that we haven't tapped into yet. But that moment that we close our eyes the last time here on earth and we open them, I think we're going to be so delighted at not only is it real, but just what happens and how a medium can connect or let me say the medium on the other side can connect with say mm -hmm. you as a medium and then me uh 3, miles away from you and uh, it's mind-boggling yeah. so i want to ask you because we talk about spiritualism a lot and i know that we'll be talking about that but what is spiritualism well, spiritualism began in 1848 in the United States. It is uh, one of the first of three American-born religions. All the other religions were imp imported from with immigrants. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but spiritualism came about in 1848 when two, two sisters, the Fox sisters in upstate New York, heard rappings on the wall and didn't know what it was and assumed it was a spirit person. And they established a method for communicating with these raps that would answer intelligently. And so that triggered what eventually evolved into a religion based on communication with the spirit world and the fact that we don't die. And What's also interesting about it is almost all religions believe in an afterlife, but spiritualism is the one to give us evidence of that. Other religions might say, oh, it's the work of the devil, or, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, oh, it can't be possible. But spiritualism says it's possible and gives us the evidence that it is. Excuse me. <laughs> no, that's okay. I want to ask you too, because I remember you saying this in the first interview that as a medium, you went out on your own and did you work with a like hundred different people to yeah, really prove to yourself the evidence of the afterlife and how mediumship works for you? You have either a good memory or you listen to the recording. <laughs> no, I didn't. It's the memory because I just thought, wow, who would do something like that? Someone who's very committed. Well, when I first wanted to develop as a medium, it was a choice. It was not something I grew up with. Like I said, I was 57 when I said, hey, I wonder if anybody can be a medium. And so it was a decision I made to develop mediumship. I, at that time, I didn't know about the SNUI. I couldn't find any local classes. I couldn't find any local mediums to study with. I didn't know what I was doing, to be honest. So I just ordered books. I ordered your book. I ordered books and read books and decided I was going to do 100 free readings as my development. And so I put out the word to fr some friends on the East Coast and some friends on the West Coast. And all of a sudden, the word free brought 100 people. <laughs> And I told them I'm developing. I don't know how accurate I am. I don't know if I'm accurate. But as it turned out, I was pretty accurate. And the more I did it, the better I got. I developed some bad habits, as I found out once I joined SNUI and got, <laughs> got some good education. But um, I pretty much was self-developed early on. Just the fact that you would go for it is an inspiration to me. And it's just wonderful. It is great. You're Fabulous. So now spiritualism, I know from all that I have studied, this is very rare in the United States. I mean, you have to go looking for it. Mm -hmm. But I've got all these friends in the UK and it seems to be in abundance over there. Yes. What happened? How, how is that possible? Well, that's where Maria B. Hayton comes in. She is the American medium who brought spiritualism to the UK in 1852 and 53. She was guided by her spirit people to go to England and spread spiritualism. And at first, she and her husband weren't sure whether that they really should do that, whether the English were really ready for this. Um, but they were reassured by their spirit friends that they would be well received. Overall, they were. But they also got a lot of criticism, a lot of skeptics, of course, who wrote a lot of negative things about Maria and her mediumship. But there were equally as many who came to her defense. 
And she convinced people like Robert Owen, who was a big um, uh, philanthropist and promoted her in newspaper articles. She convinced members of royalty, lords and ladies and countesses and counts and the upper class were her clientele. And so the uh, authors, all sorts of people who were part of the doctors that were part of the upper middle class and upper class were her clientele and who she convinced of the truth of spiritualism or we don't die. Life continues after death. Well, I have to ask though now, for her background in being a medium, she had to have some kind of clout that she could be now with people in those days mm -hmm. that would listen to her. Mm -hmm. So was she a somebody here no. in the United States? No. no. She in the United States, she was from Boston and the spirits picked her to be a medium. Uh, mediumship had start, first started, like I said, in 1848. In 1850, she and her husband started attending seances and held their own seance. And the spirits rapped and indicated that Maria would be the medium. If you got no raps, that meant no. If you got raps, that meant yes. And so they would go around the table and call out the names, you know, is William the medium? Is George the medium? Is Maria the medium? And then they got the raps that Maria was the medium. So that's how they determined who the spirits, who they would work with. Maria had built a reputation in Boston, but she had absolutely no reputation in England. So when she got over there, Fortunately or unfortunately, she suffered a miscarriage, either on the ship over or right when she got there. And she was deathly ill. In fact, they were afraid she wasn't going to survive. They called in one of the top physicians of, who were obstetricians and told them why they were here, what they were doing to spread spiritualism. And as Maria is sick in her bed, there is rapping going on constantly on her bed, on her pillows, on the walls. And so this physician was very curious about it. And he knew his friend, Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton, who was an author um, of the standing of Charles Dickens at the time. Mm -hmm. And he was very interested in seances and life after death. And so that doctor introduced Maria to Sir Edward and that's where she held her first seances in England. And then he would give them letters of introduction and her reputation just took off. Wow, could you talk a little bit about seances? Some of the listeners and viewers know, some don't. I think the word seance gets a bad rap sometimes, even though it just means meeting, but uh, mediumship didn't start out with what we have today. Right. In Maria's day, they were called seances. You and I might call them a circle. Sitting in a circle to them would be a seance. But you and I in a circle, there would be more than one medium developing. Maria was the only medium. She was the medium. So really, it was a group reading. You know, or she would do individual readings, individual seances, mm -hmm. or individual sittings. Um, but that's what the term was used for, is just the gathering of people to talk to spirit. And there was, Maria held most of her seances in broad daylight. There was nothing spooky about it. <laughs> there wasn't anything weird about it. Um, it was, it was, uh, she was very concerned that no one would accuse her of fraud because she was accused of it. So a lot of things, physical phenomenon happened in broad daylight and she was insistent upon it so that she wouldn't be accused of fraud. What kind of physical phenomena okay. happened? Well, first of all, you have the wrapping, mm -hmm. tables tilting. Mm -hmm. And this is when nobody is touching the table. Nobody is near the table. She also had into she also had instances. Uh, Sir Edward said, "Make 
the wine decanter, the wine in the wine decanter shake without making the wine decanter shake. Just make the, the wine move. Nobody's near it, and the spirits did it. Another time, the table lunged at Sir Edward because he had said something bad about the spirits, and they said, they said, ah, and so the table actually moved and practically pinned him against a wall. And then she would have uh, requests to give everyone an electric shock from the spirit world, and everyone in turn got an electric shock. And again, this is all in broad daylight. It's nobody's in a cabinet. There's no ectoplasm, and ectoplasm wasn't even coined or even a theory of mediumship until 1894, 40 years after Maria. Wow. It was all the energy of the spirit world. It's amazing how things unravel, and here we are today in 2021. Mm -hmm. In those days, what was the proof that it was the afterlife, not just somebody thinking it's a ghost or goblin making the table move. Right. Well, of course they, you know, a lot of skeptics thought Maria was kicking the table leg or uh, cracking her toes. Well, if you've ever tried to crack your toes for two hours, it's impossible. And her seances would last two to three hours. Um, or she was accused of having an accomplice who was making the noise. Well, a lot of times her husband wasn't even present and she didn't know a soul in the room. There just simply was no other explanation but the spirit world. And she, like spiritualists today, are very confident that they're attracting good spirits, that like attracts like, that they're attracting not demons and not um, uh, what we call ghosts in a negative way, but spirits who truly want to communicate and prove there is life after death. Did they do, was it raps and taps that they would know that it was somebody's loved one or? Okay, so how did that right. happen? Maria's form and method, method of mediumship uh -huh. is the early Ouija board. She had a cardboard printed with the letters of the alphabet, one through nine and zero. And what would happen is she would start the communication and say, who are you here for? And they would name the people around the table. Raps meant yes, no raps meant no. And then when the communication started, a person, it didn't have to be the recipient, it could have been anybody in the room, would point to the letters of the alphabet until they formed words and sentences. It was very laborious. They didn't have an indicator like a Ouija board. But this is the early um, mm -hmm. day Ouija board, actually. She didn't know that. That's not what it was called then. It was just a piece of cardboard with letters and numbers on it. And so they would point to the letters. If, if they pointed to an A and there was no rap, they would go to a B. If there's no rap, they go to the C. If there's a rap, they write C down. And they would do that, like I said, to form letters and sentences and information and messages. Boy, have things changed, haven't they? <laughs> yes. That's why the seance has lasted two to three hours. <laughs> but just like now, we are so desperate to know that the afterlife is real and that our loved ones made it. I would sit all night long hoping that the name would spell out or something like that. Well, and we have to remember in 1852, any, you know, the early 1850s until the mid 1900s, uh, there was no radio, there was no television. This became evening entertainment. And people were doing this in their households, I yeah. believe, too. Uh -huh. Maria yeah. would either do it in her house or she would go to a person's house and hold a seance. Wow. I remember seeing, this is totally off subject, <laughs> but I think it was Judy Garland, A Star is Born. And there's one of the scenes that she's on stage doing some kind of an act. But I was reading what was printed on the stage and it was like from an old vaudeville or something, but it said seances uh, nightly <laughs> in the name of the medium. And I thought, I mean, that just kind of caught my eye because it just, it was like, it was a regular thing. Right. Well, and mediums like the Fox sisters who are the ones in upstate New York who are the wrapping, we call them the Hydesville wrappings. 
um, they would hold seances in auditoriums. Wow. This was at a time when entertainment was all live. People yes. went to theaters to hear lectures, to, to go to plays, of course. Science and entertainment were merged at that time. And new discoveries were demonstrated on the stage. And so spirit communication was became a form of entertainment. And so people would go to the theater to hear the Fox sisters and to hear the raps. Or Emma Harding's Britain, who was from England, who toured in America, would do trance lectures. So this was, this was their entertainment. But it also served the purpose of building spiritualism and building uh, a religion. Yeah, incredible. So let's go back to Maria. She gets over to the UK. Tell, tell us more stories. <laughs> okay, so she was there for a year. A lot of people think the reason she left was because of all the negative press she received. She did not. She was pregnant. And she had already lost a baby. Um, prior to coming to England, she had given birth to a child who died when uh, I believe the child was nine months old. When the child died. In fact, that was the first spiritualist service held in Boston was for her child. Um, wow. So she was pregnant again and came back to America, resettled in Boston and picked up her career in Boston and was highly reputed for her accuracy. Eventually, she decides to take her mediumship to New York City. At this time as well, she is transitioning from just spirit communication to being a healing medium. And part of the reason I feel she was doing this, I don't have any letters or diaries or documents to say why, but the reason I feel she was doing this, it was at this time in the 1860s that mediumship was taking a turn. And that's when physical mediumship started to be held in the dark. Mediums started to withdraw into cabinets started to allow themselves to be bound and gagged and searched internally. And it took away all of women's power. And Maria was not one to do that. She might have subjected herself to having herself to having her ankles tied so that they could be sure she wasn't kicking the table and making the wraps. But that's as far as she would go. She was very, uh, concerned about her reputation. So about the 1860s is when she starts to shift to healing mediumship and goes back to a gift that she received as a child of knowing when people were sick, what was wrong with them, and spirit giving spirit remedies. She called this claro sympathy. Claire, as in clairvoyance, clear seeing, whatever. This was clear sympathy. She had sympathy with the person's body. She would hold their hand. Essentially, she was psychometrizing the person. And she could diagnose what was wrong with the person. And then her spirit team would give her remedies. And again, she was hailed as being so accurate in this. And no one, you know, few people know about Maria B. Hayden to begin with. What they do know about her is she brought spiritualism to the UK, but they don't know the rest of her story, that she was also a fantastic healing medium. And then in her 40s, went to medical school and graduated wow. as a medical doctor and was respected, highly respected by her male colleagues as an excellent diagnostician. Was she still a medium? Yep. See, ladies and gentlemen, if this episode tells you nothing else is it's never too late. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, she didn't advertise herself as a medium after nope. she became a medical doctor, but she used her mediumship. She used her psychometry in her medical practice. In fact, one doctor said her name was forgotten by the Board of Health because she never had to sign death certificates because she was able to cure her patients. <laughs> Other medical doctors would send their patients to her for a proper diagnosis and treatment. 
That's fantastic. So yeah. meanwhile, what's happening in England? She literally just making that one trip got the ball rolling? Right. She had intended, and she did go back in 1855. But they wouldn't place, the, the, the newspapers wouldn't place her ad, even though all they wanted to say is Maria Hayden is back and open for business. They wouldn't place her ads. But another medium had come forward who got all the attention. And that was Daniel Douglas Hume, or Home. And he was getting all the attention now. And so with his levitation, and just is mind blowing. I know, he would levitate and go out of windows and come back in. And people witnessed this. And people witnessed this. So with his mediumship, Maria was like, eh, you're old news, you're a has-been. Um, but after she left, even though her husband started the first spiritualist newspaper in England, it was just a one-off, but another person started a spiritualist newspaper, a spiritualist center, and gradually it started to take off in England. And it grew more so, well, I shouldn't say more so, it grew quite a bit in America, but after World War I, World War II, especially, it started to decline here in America, whereas in England, it continued to flourish. And that's why it's so active over there, and it's not as active over here. Why do you think it started to die off over here in the United States? Well, I think with the, um, especially after World War II, our focus started to change because we were having fewer children. Back in Maria's day, families had a lot of children. Almost every family suffered at least one loss, sometimes several losses of mm -hmm. children. And World War II, I'm sorry, World War I, Civil War, they wanted to hear from their loved ones. After World War II, the family size decreased and life expectancy increased. So you didn't lose as many people. There wasn't that need, there wasn't that grief to feel the need to contact their loved ones in the spirit world. Whereas London and England suffered so much more during World War II than we did because of the blitz over there, the bombings over there, they suffered so much more loss than we did because we didn't fight that war on our land. So, and then after World War II, you see more uh, also not only the decrease in family size, but also uh, uh, suburbs are cropping up and people are scattered more. We've got radio and television to distract us. So we don't have as much interest in sitting in circles or seances. And I know over in the UK and maybe over here too, a lot of prominent people got involved with spiritualism. You had your doctors and your scientists and all that. And I do know too, there, was a, there were skeptic people and I bet, and you probably know that there were a lot of frauds oh, yeah. pretending to be mediums that would give mediumship a bad name. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons that Maria, I think, decided to go to medical school. She cared about her reputation. Not only, and this was a little bit before medical licenses were required. She, after she got into medical school and graduated, she served on boards to interview people who were advertising themselves as clairvoyant physicians because they didn't have a medical license to practice. And so she was on the committees to interview those people in New York City to find out if they were legitimate and whether or not they deserve to have a medical license, um, an honorary medical license, or they needed to be fined. So she very much cared about legitimacy. Which I know you and I do as well, because yeah. yeah. <laughs> just because it's the year 2021 and medical information and doctors, everybody certified in this world of mediumship, you don't have to be. And right. Uh, right. Yeah. I can practice as a medical intuitive and I do, but I tell my clients, I'm not a medical doctor. 
what I'm trying to do is get to the root cause of your problem. I'm not trying to diagnose whether you have cancer or whether you have this disease or that disease. I'm trying to get what was the root cause that triggered your body to manifest disease. That's something you don't get typically with a medical doctor, but you do get that with an intuitive. You're an amazing woman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, you're doing so much you're following your passions and you help people in so many ways uh, where where are we going to what are we going to talk about next well i don't uh, know what to ask you but i okay, know well, there's good stuff to be cover of the book <laughs> and to our friends listening on podcast you're going to have to look on amazon in search of maria b hayden to see the cover yeah. oh what a beautiful woman she is Yes, well, and I'd like to talk about her photograph as well. Uh, yes, the book is available not only on Amazon in the US, but Amazon in the UK and around the world. So no matter where you live, you can find it on your Amazon. You may have to pay quite a bit more for it in some countries. In fact, I have one lady in the Netherlands, she said, would you order it for me through the Amazon US? Because it's a lot cheaper that way, even with the shipping. Is it on Kindle yet? No, it will not be. It's only in print. Okay, all right. Okay, so uh, um, it's the way it goes. Um, so Maria, prior to my research, which I started in 2016, I've been researching her since 2016. No one knew of a photograph of her. I contacted archivists, librarians, everybody I could think of posted on Facebook. Has anybody seen a photograph? No, nobody had a photograph of, or a positively identified photograph of her. And so I searched and searched and searched and could not find a photograph of her. One website about Maria B. Hayden has Queen Victoria's photograph. <laughs> oh my goodness. So nobody had a photograph. So the genealogist in me is not deterred by that. What I did is I traced all of her descendants forward in time and I contacted them, hoping that somebody in the family would have a photograph. And they did. Amazing. And they did. And so that's how I was able, and her photograph is complete in the book. On the cover, it's just the, the head and shoulders part, but the full photograph is actually in the book. And it's all, I also have another website, mariabhayden.net, and the photograph is also on there. So um, yeah, so it took almost uh, three, three and a half years to find her photograph. Her relatives that remain, do they know her story? Um, they knew a little bit about her. They did know she was a spiritualist. She was a medium. Um, they had, they had had some family stories handed down about her. What they mostly knew is she was a medical doctor because one of the family members had a prescription pad. And so I've got that reproduced in the book as well. So they, they didn't know the extent of her reputation. They did not know the extent of her reputation. And then I also traced, uh, Maria was married to a man named William Hayden. And after Maria died, he married a third time. His youngest child still had a granddaughter living. I'm sorry, a daughter living. Okay. The genealogist in me has to sort this out. Okay. That's so, okay. You're William, forgiven. One of William's granddaughters was still living, is still living. And so I contacted her. This was before I got the picture of Maria. And I said, do you happen to have a picture of Maria in your family? Um, she did not because she didn't descend from Maria. But William continued on. He bought a, a huge estate in Bedford Hills, Massachusetts, and established a, a health resort. And he lived to, uh, she died, Maria died in 1883. He lived another 20 years later. And his estate was not even settled until the 1970s because the last grandchild had to turn 21. 
And so I was in touch with her as well. And she generously shared photographs of the estate uh, of William, of William's family, which is also in the book. I, the family was just incredible in helping me, both Maria's descendants and William's descendants. That's they were great. fabulous in helping me. Um, and in fact, one of William's, William was known, where is it? Hang on. It's behind my computer. No problem. No, it isn't. Where did I put it? Oh my, how can I not have this? Okay, they've disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I have William's med medical bottles, his medicine bottles, because he, he did um, uh, patent medicines. And to be and still normally, looking. They're normally on my desk behind my computer and they're not there. That's all right. Maybe they will escort them back in. I was like, where did they go? They're always there. I, I know you as a medium. You have made reconnections for people that anyone who has experienced deep grief knows the pain of a loved one no longer physically being here. I mean, there's no way around it. Grief is, to me, the worst, most painful thing. You have witnessed and been part of medium readings to help heal mended hearts. And even though you can't, we can't heal grief right. for people to know, oh my gosh, there's no way this lady could know this information about my loved one other than they're talking to her. And so, I mean, you know, the power of good mediumship. And I have seen so many amazing mediums that have come through spiritualism and even phil and carrie that are our mediums on our sunday gathering are spectacular mm -hmm. and they've come through that lineage and to think that this woman maria one person made the journey she did with the stand that she had and now all of this is possible in the world so I think everyone who drinks, even if you don't need to drink a cup of tea, will raise a glass to her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, she's basically, if I, you know, if she hadn't gone to England, somebody else would have. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But why her? Why do the spirits choose her to go? And yeah, like I said, Daniel Douglas Hume went and he was a sensation and everything else. But what <clears throat> levitation, what does that prove about the afterlife? Mm. Maria was giving messages, sometimes paragraphs. In fact, I reproduce one of her uh, in the book, one of her messages that a daughter gave to the father. It's three handwritten pages. And again, through the wraps of pointing to letters, it, it was incredibly laborious, but it meant so much to people to know that their loved ones were safe, that they would join them again, they would see them again. As I say, times change, but people don't. Human emotions do not change. People in the 1850s grieved just as much as we grieve today. Absolutely. And, you know, Maria was there to provide that, that help, those messages. What's also interesting in the book, in the appendix, is I have communication from Maria after she passed, historically and through mediums who have brought her through for me. Without Let's me. hear about this. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, initially, before I had her photograph, I had her signature. And so I shared that with a couple of mediums. And I said, can you connect with her and see what you get? And so I've reproduced those readings in the book. But I've also sat in circles on SNUI and have had people say, I, you know, I have a lady here who's not of our times. And she's a spiritualist. And, you know, I'm in the, I'm the only one in the room who can take it. <laughs> and we'll talk about her personality and what she was like. And cool. so 
I, you know, there is no doubt in my mind that she was helping me. And I don't know whether she chose me to be her biographer or I chose her to write the book, but there was definitely a collaboration there. Absolutely. What else is in the book? I mean, you have a big book there. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's 600 pages, <laughs> 600 that, pages, which are ah! Um, the actual narrative, the actual story of her life is only about 370 pages. I've also got her genealogy and her husband's genealogy in there. I've reproduced her medical articles from medical journals, so they aren't lost. I reproduced, like I said, one of the readings, individual reading seances that she did. Um, I contacted, I had two spirit artists draw her before I had the photograph. So I have side by side comparisons of the spirit artists with, with her photograph. That's pretty great. Yeah, I mean, there's everything but the kitchen sink in here. <laughs> it might even be that I, if we look I hard enough. I wanted it to be the definitive biography of this woman. I, I, everything I could find about her is in here. And it, and it tells a fascinating story of a woman who was so far ahead of her time, so far ahead of her time, not only being a medium and a working woman in the 1850s and 60s, but going to medical school. She wasn't the first woman in the United States to graduate from medical school, but she was among a handful who did. That's amazing. What has researching her journey meant to you in your life? Um, it's, it's made me realize a couple of things. One, I think the whole reason I became a medium was so I could tell her story with a sympathetic side. So I could understand her so that I could prove she wasn't a fraud. Because I think if you had somebody writing a biography about her who was a skeptic, they might walk away with a, a different rendition of her life. Of course, I had a bias. I tried not, I tried to be as objective as I could. Um, but of course, there is a bias there. But as a fellow medium, I can tell a bad medium from a good medium. You can. And so I could say, okay, she had a bad reading here. Here's probably why. She had just suffered a miscarriage you know, or here's another reason why she probably had a bad reading. And that's the thing they didn't take into account in the 1850s. They didn't realize that mediums aren't 100% accurate. No medium is. They expected her to be. And so then when she wasn't, there would be negative articles about her. But those who were open-minded realized no medium is 100% accurate. So her story really influenced me as a medium as well. She inspired me to learn medical intuitive work. And I feel like she was guiding me in learning that. Um, but I really feel that Maria's story is just um, so in the shadows and it needed to come out. It's inspiration for anyone who thinks, can my life make a difference? Who mm -hmm. am I? I'm just one person. And whether it's bringing mediumship to the UK or offering a kind word to a person that's having a lousy day and might be on the verge of doing something drastic, we never know the difference that we make, do we? That's right. In fact, I would like to read you just a short section um, after she got to spirit world, what she said. She says, and this came through another medium. I wish to say to you, do not dread the transition from that world to this. There is nothing to fear. Accustom yourselves to anticipate it and discipline your bodies to overcome that instinctive shrinking, which they feel. The passage will then be easier. I have met my children, and she had two in the spirit world at that time, who I love so much. And they with others have provided for me a most beautiful home. Indeed, my reception here was a great surprise. I did not know that I had done anything on earth to merit distinction, but I was met by a great number, many of whom I do not remember, who said that I had been the instrument of bringing life and immortality to light to them. And they have come to welcome me 
from Earth. That is so nice. I know. Isn't that amazing? It gave me goosebumps. I know. Me too. <laughs> so even she didn't realize the impact she had wow. until she got to the spirit world when she was greeted by so many people. Yeah. Sharon, we're going through a very tough time currently on planet Earth. From a medium's point of view and everything you've learned, what words would you tell someone about the spirit world or lest I say the dying process or what awaits us and are our loved ones okay? Yes. Well, they're definitely okay. What saddens me is when people are grieving that their loved one died alone. Yes. No one dies alone. No one dies alone. The spirit world knows when we're ready to transition and the spirit world is there with us to greet us. And so if anything, I wish people would take that piece of comfort with them. I know you can't be there with them. I wasn't there with my father or my mother when they transitioned. And this was before COVID. I wasn't able to be with them, but I knew the spirit world was. And so if we can hold on to that thought that no one ever dies alone, I hope that will give us some comfort. Absolutely. That new radio show that I have, I dedicated a whole episode on that, on all the different stories, even with children. Exactly. We don't die alone. No. We're greeted. We're, there's so many smiling faces often Mm -hmm. with people uh, and they can see what we can't see. I was a hospice volunteer before COVID and um, sat with a woman who was dying. And even though she wasn't conscious of me, I was aware of her sister being there with her, who's in the spirit world. And so when the dying woman's family came, I didn't know whether they would appreciate it or not, but I let them know. I said, her sister is here with her to take her. And they said, well, which one? I said, it was the one who was like a mother to her. It was the older sister. And they knew right away who it was. And I said, she's, she's going to go with her. She's, she's not going to have a problem. So um, yeah, it's a blessing to know no one dies alone. It is. Now, how about we'll flip this side because as great as death is, well, not maybe the, <laughs> well, well yeah. over there. Right. How about living life? Life's tough right now. What can our souls make of it? And why are we here, do you think? Well, I think we're, we're always here to learn lessons, whether they are lessons on a personal level or lessons on a grander scheme that the world needs to know, that the country needs to know, whatever. And I think even though between COVID and the political situation and everything that is so upsetting and, and so um, uh, stressful for everyone, there's a reason for it. I firmly believe everything happens for a reason. And there is a reason all of this is happening at this time and there will be light at the end of the tunnel and it will turn for the better. It will not be perfect. It will never be perfect because if it were perfect, we would be in the spirit world. <laughs> it's not perfect here. And it's not perfect here for a reason and that's to learn lessons. So whether it's learning how um, to be with ourselves in, during a lockdown, whether it's learning how to be tolerant of people who don't hold the same views we do, uh, whether it's learning um, a different way of life. There are lessons always to be learned from the negative and the positive. I agree. And just the fact that we just had New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, so many people are so anxious to get rid of 2020. And I just took some time to say, what good has come out of 2020? And to think, one of, you know, I live with my mom now, and one of her biggest things is that we never got to spend that much time together, mm -hmm. and we have that, mm -hmm. and I have always wanted to explore my spirituality more, but never had time, 
And the fact that I practice mediumship in training on Zoom meetings with everybody else who's in our Thursday class, and we start classes every month. The stuff that's come out of my own feelings for other people that's accurate, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. But the bigger picture is it, the days aren't always easy. And bills need to get paid and there's right. struggles and all that. But the fact that I can witness miracles even coming through me, it, it helps me on a daily basis remember that there's a much bigger picture. And I would have never in a million years thought, while I'm no Maria, the fact that I've been able to figure out technology in a way to deliver our free Sunday service to thousands of people who will maybe never step foot in a spiritualist church. And they just happen to be on the internet or see it on YouTube or on Facebook and connected, say mothers with their deceased children or whoever. What a gift that is. So for everyone, you can look at the toughest times and think what good has come out of them. And certainly we look forward, we look forward to positivity, but if we are these souls having a human experience, we are powerful beings. You don't have to wait for things to happen in your life to feel good. You can do things. You can start feeling good and sharing that. Mm -hmm. We all have our different passions. And I, not everyone has to be a medium or a Maria, but wh whoever you are for other people and whatever you're most passionate about, let your light shine. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, and one thing I've learned about mediumship I thought when I became a medium, the only way to serve people is to do private readings. Right. It is not. Being Tracing your ancestry is serving spirit. Writing your ancestor's story is serving spirit. And if I may just get a little plug in here. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm doing a book launch on zoom and you can go to my facebook page and see that'll be on saturday january 16th and then i'm also starting monthly writing webinars because i strongly believe that telling our story telling spirit story is serving spirit and so those will start on january 19th and i'll be posting about that in the next few days but you can go to my nonfictionhelp.com website and click on uh, online courses and webinars and sign up for the monthly writing webinars. Pretty great. And what's your Facebook page? Uh, you can either go to Sharon D. Bartolo Carmack, that's my personal page, you can friend me, or you can go to Sharon D. Bartolo Carmack. I think I, under Spiritualist Meeting, Medium is my professional page. Okay. And can and people contact you as a medium and a? I am presently not doing any readings because okay. I'm writing and promoting my book and I'm on my next book project. So I'm presently not doing any readings. Um, and like I said, I feel one of the advantages of COVID is it has made so many classes and services available online. And one of the disadvantages is it has made so many classes and services available online that I feel there's another need that I can meet. Absolutely. And that is to tell life stories. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, one of the reasons I feel I became a medium was to tell Maria's story. And so I wanna carry that through and uh, get hopefully get some people thinking about and interested in writing either their own life stories, their own spiritual journey, or that of their ancestors or a relative or whomever. Oh, that's great. And tell us again, the best website to follow you on. Okay. Uh, nonfictionhelp.com. Easy to remember. Has my, uh, right. Well, all my websites have my writing. <laughs> so um, SharonCarmack.com is my genealogy website that also has the writing webinars on it. Pathwaysup.com is my mediumship website, which also has my writing webinars on it. But again, I'm not doing any readings at the moment. Okay. 
And mariabhayden.net has everything you want to know about Maria, except for everything that's in the book. <laughs> 600 pages in the book. Yes. No, it's great. I'm so oh, well, proud of you. A lot of it's footnotes and bibliography. You know, the footnotes and bibliography start on, oh, I don't know. Don't page. tell us. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> they, they start later. <laughs> wow. You know, and it's interesting because, yes, I have a book. I never thought I was a writer. Mm -hmm. But if you can talk, <laughs> you're a writer. <laughs> if you can talk, you can write. Really? Big words don't have to be used. As it, 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 they really shouldn't be. No. And, you know, even though Maria Hayden's book is 600 pages, it's not difficult reading. It's not complex where you really have to sit down and digest it. It's telling her story mm -hmm. in nonfiction form. Wow, that's so inspiring. You can help people write because so many people, their stories die with them. Exactly. And there's not going to be a fabulous woman 150 years later to come right. <laughs> write the story. Exactly. Exactly. So get your stories down now. Even if you don't publish it, at least get it down, print it out for your friends, your family, whatever. You know, get it down. You don't have to publish it. Mm -mm. And even if you wanted to, I mean, it's so much, it's so easy to do a self publishing these days to have it recorded for your family. That's right. Oh, well, Sharon, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank you, Sandra. I appreciate so much you having me on, letting me talk about all my favorite things. Oh, and I want to encourage people to go back and listen to that episode 142 because it's really good. We talk about different stuff, but I remember that episode because I just, you left me wowed, like that you. you did what you did for humanity and being able to share the good word that we don't die. And I think that's incredible. Yep. Absolutely thank incredible. Well, for our listener or our viewer, well, thank you so much for being part of this. We hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, you may or may not know some of the things we have available. We have a Facebook group. If you're on Facebook, you can type in We Don't Die Listeners. The home base for all the shows is We Don't Die Radio.com. There you can find now 356 episodes. It's quite a few, all on the afterlife. There's also a link there to the new show, Shades of the Afterlife. And depending on when you listen, there's right now uh, 11 episodes of that show, which is great. There's a pop-up that comes on your screen asking if you wanna join our Insiders Club. That's just a snazzy term for my mailing list. And it's all the good things that are going on. There's also a calendar there. And like I said, on Sundays, we do a free Sunday gathering is what we call it. There's music videos, there's a reading, there's a spiritual address, there's healing. And then by nature of Zoom, we do medium readings on our online congregation. It's, it's fantastic. And while COVID is still going on, which I can imagine it's not friendly for the world to travel um, for quite a few months, we are doing our Monday classes with Scott Milligan. He is the world's foremost physical medium and he's a trance medium. And we sit with our eyes closed and we learn how to blend with the unseen world and quiet our mind. And Wednesdays with Phil and Carrie teaching our psychic nature. And we work in breakout rooms with other people and you get to do psychic readings on people and flex that psychic muscle. And then Thursdays, you use that same psychic muscle, but not on a living person. You use it on a person in the unseen world and you learn mediumship. So we also do different um, medium demonstrations and things like that. So it's been fun. It's been great. We would love for you to join us. If you feel like joining us for any of those, um, please do. So again, we don't die radio.com is the home base for it all. So in closing, I want to thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Another big thank you to Sharon. You're just the best girlfriend. You're great. Uh, my name is Sandra Champlain. I'm always so delighted to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So look back, find the good, look forward, make things happen. 
You are a divine soul having a human experience. You are so much more powerful than you even know. So thank you for listening or thank you for viewing and we'll see you soon.